Welcome to our Gifts and Baptism in the Holy Spirit class here at Fire School Ministry. We're continuing this week on pages 52 through 57. We're going to talk about why Christians believe the gifts and the baptism in the Holy Spirit are for today. Father, we thank you for the power of your Spirit and ask as we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, you would give us insight into understanding the gifts that we might be prepared, ready to ask you to use us and function through us the way that you so desire to. In Jesus' name, amen. Three categories, groups of the spiritual gifts. Well, group one is revelation gifts. This is where something is supernaturally revealed. And these three gifts are, number one, a word of wisdom. Number two, a word of knowledge. Number three, discerning of spirits. And group number two is the power gifts, which is when we supernaturally do something. And number one, the gift of special faith, the gift of healings with an S, and number three, the working of miracles. So far we have revelation gifts, power gifts, and group three, vocal inspirational gifts, which is when we supernaturally say something, which is number one, the gift of prophecy, number two, the gift of tongues, and number three, interpretation of tongues. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11, it says, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So it's important to recognize that God gives these gifts as he determines. It's not based on your personality. It's not based on your experience. But as you and I learn to rightly divide the word and understand the gifts that have been made available to us through the baptism in the Holy Spirit, we become aware of how God wants to use us. We're not going to know how to be used in a word of knowledge or prophecy if we don't understand the definitions of what each of those gifts are. So that's what we're going to get in. But it, I want you to understand these three groups, revelation gifts, power gifts, and vocal inspirational gifts. First of all, there's the word of wisdom. A definition for the word of wisdom is it reveals a fraction of the mind of God concerning people, places, or things pertaining to the future. Through this supernatural gift, God lets us know how he wants us to deal with a specific situation as it arises in the future, in the future. So word of wisdom, think future. Think something supernatural that God makes us aware of. Here's some biblical examples of a word of wisdom. Well, first, a word of wisdom usually points to the future events. It usually gives insight into the planning of future events and deals with what will happen. Number one, God revealed to Noah the coming of the flood, as we see in Genesis 6, 12 through 13. That was supernaturally revealed. At that point, there had never been any type of flood. I don't even know how much it was raining on the earth at that point. Some people have different perspectives on that. But the fact of the matter is, even if you knew a flood was going to come and you were used to rain, who would think that rain would mean the entire earth would be flooded? Well, God revealed that to Noah himself. Another example is, number two, God revealed to Isaiah the crucifixion of Jesus. If you look in Isaiah, let's go there to Isaiah 53, it sounds so much like the crucifixion. 
Let's look starting in verse 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces, hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And it goes up, you know, in verse 7, it says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter as a sheep before its shearers are silent. He did not open his mouth. Jesus didn't defend himself. He knew, uh, Philippians tells us that it was for the joy set before him that he was enduring the cross. But if you read on in Isaiah 53, you see that God is trying to give us a word of wisdom. Next, John prof God prophesied, number three, that in the last days the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all flesh. Joel 2.28. We see this reiterated in Acts chapter 2, where Peter stands up after they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, spilling outside, and people think they're drunk. And Peter says, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he begins to reiterate, Joel 2, In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Upon all people, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. It's a word of wisdom. Number four, Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream. Genesis 41, 14 through 40. How else could he have been given this except a gift of God? Now, yes, Joseph was not baptized in the Holy Spirit, nor was he born again. But can't God do whatever he wants? He put his spirit that was upon Moses on the other elders in Numbers chapter 11, and they began to prophesy. It was temporary, and Joshua was like, stop them, Moses. And Moses said, I wish that all of God's people, are you jealous for me, for my sake, that God chose me to be the prophet? I wish that all of God's people would prophesy. Now, if we look in Acts chapter 2 again, when the Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, they all prophesied. Except this time, the prophecy wasn't for temporary means. It was the gift of God being manifested because Jesus has risen from the dead. The Holy Spirit's been poured out. And now we are called to be a prophetic people. On all flesh, God anoints to speak in tongues, to prophesy as the Spirit enables us. And then uh, number five, God gave Abraham a word of wisdom that he would make him a great nation and bless him. Genesis 2, 2 through 3. This is what we see today. Even Israel today is back in the land since 1948. And yet we see this word of wisdom was spoken thousands of years ago to Abraham from God himself. And he said, I will make your people like the stars in the sky. And he's brought them back to the land of Israel the Jewish people, the enemies tried to wipe off the map so many times, but yet they're still around. They're God's chosen people. And when God gives a word of wisdom, he fulfills it and he sustains it. Number six, the prophet Agabus received and prophesied a word of wisdom concerning Paul being arrested and bound in prison in Jerusalem. He said that he would be chained and that he would suffer persecution and hardship. And, you know, you would think, well, why would God say that? Well, to prepare him so that he could be ready to know what to expect. If you know that God says you're going to endure something like this or that something like this would happen to you, you actually sense more grace knowing that God's in control. Of course, all the time we want in our flesh to just be delivered from these things. And nobody looks for persecution in the natural 
But the reality is, Jesus said, those who live godly will be persecuted, be hated, despised. and reje If Jesus was despised and rejected by all men, how much more we who represent him and his, as his body. He's still the head of the church. And so where the head goes, the body goes. And yet, God used Paul's suffering and persecution to get the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome, which eventually spread to other nations as well. And number seven, Jesus had a word of wisdom that Peter would deny him three times. He told Peter that he would deny him three times. And Peter said adamantly, I'm not going to deny you, Lord. But yet he did. And yet isn't it amazing that when Jesus, after Jesus rises from the dead and he appears to Peter and the disciples on the beach as they were fishing and not catching any fish. And the Lord speaks from the beach and says, hey, throw your net one more time. And then Peter realizes it's the Lord because they catch 153 fish. He jumps into the water, swims to the shore, and Jesus is making breakfast. And as they're eating together, talking, Peter and John are sitting there listening to Jesus. And Jesus in front of everybody says, Peter, feed my lambs. Peter, feed my lambs. Peter, three times. And after a while, Peter got a little disturbed. But I think Peter had a revelation at the same time. He denied Jesus three times, but now Jesus is restoring him completely. And that's what God wants to do with a word of wisdom. He wants to let us know what's going to happen in advance. And at the same time, to know how to be prepared for it. Because persecution is not the end. The glory of God is what it's all about. A word of knowledge. Here's a definition of a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is a revelation by the Holy Spirit giving a piece of God's knowledge and information concerning people and situations in the present. It is God's diagnosis of a problem, a sickness, or any situation in the present or near current past. Present or near current past. Biblical examples of a word of knowledge. And now remember, word of wisdom is about a future event. Word of knowledge is about a current or just recent past event. A word of knowledge usually speaks about present or near past situations. Number one, Joshua received a word of knowledge about why the city of Ai was not taken. He found out that there was a young man who kept an idol who kept back something for himself and hid it, and yet God revealed it to Joshua as a word of knowledge, and that's why Israel couldn't conquer I immediately, but eventually they did after they did what God told them to do. Number two, Elisha knew by the word of knowledge the location of the Syrian military camp, thereby saving Israel from being attacked. This is why the Gifts of the Spirit are so important. If we can hear God better, we might not be caught up in situations that aren't meant to destroy us, but for God to reveal his power through and demonstrate himself to encourage us that he is faithful and he's watching over us and he will deliver us. And that was 2 Kings 6, 8 through 23. Uh, number three, Ananias and Sapphira. This is New Testament. Peter knew by a word of knowledge that they had lied to God about the money from the sale of the property. They were all, all people had all things in common and were giving up land and property and things to bless the, the growth of the church, the body of Christ, and they were helping out those in need. But they, at the time when this was happening, Ananias and Sapphira kept back money they were supposed to be giving, and they lied, they deceived people, and Peter knew by a word of knowledge and said that, you know, you're both going to die, and immediately they both died at different occasions, but one right after the other. And while that's sad and it might seem harsh, the fact is it was revealed by a word of knowledge. Don't lie. Acts 5, 1 through 10. Uh, number four. Jesus knew by a word of knowledge about the coin in the fish's mouth. So 
If you want to know how to pay your taxes, Jesus is saying, hey, why don't you uh, understand, give to Caesar what's Caesar and, Caesar and give to God what's God, right? He said that. Uh, but when the coin was found in the fish's mouth, he was making him realize, the disciples realized that God can not only provide for your need, but he's actually over everything. So it's not about just giving money because God needs money, but it's about being faithful stewards with what God gives you so that he can continue to bless you. Because having money is not wrong, but the love of money is the root of all evil. So if we don't love it, maybe God will entrust us with things that we can use for whatever purposes we have need of in the kingdom so that we can glorify God and show everybody that money is not our God, Jesus is. That was Matthew 17, 27. Number five, when Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, he received a word of knowledge supernaturally and revealed her whole life to her in John 4, 7 through 19. He told her that how many men she's been with and the current husband she had now is not her husband. And she said, I believe you're a prophet. And, and Jesus was trying to reveal himself to her through a word of knowledge. As she was a Samaritan woman, she was not fully Jewish, partially Jewish. And the Samaritans were despised by Jews uh, because they were Greek-speaking Jews. But then you see Jesus loving her, ministering to her at the well, and changed her life forever as she came to realize he was the Messiah. So flowing in the gift of the word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is simply information received from the Holy Spirit. Seven common ways that we receive words of knowledge. Number one, we feel it. There could be a pain in a part of your body or heat in a part of your body where you feel like God wants to deliver somebody or God wants to heal somebody. Number two, we see it. We have mental pictures. A lot of times I'll have a picture when I'm ministering or during an altar call when I'm praying for people or in a small group praying for people and I just see a picture. It doesn't make any sense to me, but I begin to describe what I see and then suddenly it means like something to someone. They're sobbing, sobbing and they're broken and you build off of that word of knowledge and God knows how to set people free. We read it. You may see in your mind. Like a news headline. This is another way I feel like the Lord speaks to me through like headlines or scriptures and things like that. And then it opens up ministry opportunities uh, that someone has a need of that I wouldn't have been sensitive to unless I paid attention to what the Lord was speaking to me. Number five, say, or I'm sorry, number four, think it. A mental impression or the Holy Spirit speaks a word to you that suddenly God just drop something in your mind and it just, you know, it's the Lord. It's not just because you ate too much pizza the night before, but it's because you're sensing, wow, this is a direction that I wasn't thinking about, but yet the Lord just dropped this in my mind. Number five, say it while praying or talking with somebody. You're, you're just having a casual conversation and then you might sense just a word of knowledge come on. And you, you're saying something to somebody and they're receiving it and they notice God speaking through you to them and you notice God speaking through you to them. And so you're not trying to control what's coming out of your mouth, but you're releasing it because you recognize God has something he wanted to say to somebody. Number six, you dream it. Uh, you may have vivid dreams. I'm not a big dreamer. When I have a dream, it's usually pretty specific, but my wife and my kids, a lot of them have had dreams over the years that have been very specific. And it's amazing how powerful God could speak through dreams and through visions. Number seven, you experience it. Something to dreaming. You may have a vivid vision while awake. You're actually a part of of what's happening. You know, sometimes people call that daydreaming where you, you get caught up. Now, I did a lot of daydreaming when I was in high school because I wanted to get out of school. But what I'm saying is, is that when you're focused on something and some, then it's like suddenly God grips your mind, your understanding, and you're, you're 
meditating on something and something's coming to your mind, to your remembrance, to your understanding, and then boom, you know, the Lord opens. I've had times where I suddenly thought about somebody I hadn't seen in a long time. And so maybe I begin to pray for them or I become sensitive to see them. And then I walk around the corner, I walk in the mall and there's this person. And I'm like, oh my goodness, the Lord showed me you early. And I go tell them. And it doesn't have to be like a specific word, but just the fact that God put them on my heart. And, and they know that sometimes that's all people need is to know that God's thinking about them. And that if, if you don't see somebody for a while and he suddenly puts you on their heart, it's amazing how that can minister to people. So context for receiving a word of knowledge. Number one, the Lord often gives a word of knowledge for a specific need. This can build the faith of the person who has the need. Number two, you may receive a word of knowledge anywhere, any place, and any time. The more specific the word of knowledge is, the more faith builds in the people involved. I would say the more that you keep your head, your face in the word of God, you build up God's vocabulary for you to speak his language, so to say. And as we speak the language of the Lord over and over, we meditate on his word, we confess his word, we live out his word. Then when God speaks to us out of his word or gives us a word of knowledge for somebody in a present situation, we will know when it's the Lord or the difference between it's knowing it's the Lord, our flesh, the world, or, you know, even just a, a temptive thought or something just to want, you know, there's a lot of people who, when they're praying for people and they want to be prophetic in church situations and in their mind, they want to give somebody a direction, you know, Lord says you're going to marry somebody and and maybe they try to pair them off with somebody in the church. Well, we need to be real careful and make sure that's the Lord. Because if it's not, to give people directional words of knowledge without knowing that's exactly from God, that can be very dangerous for somebody. It could play on their emotions. But I do believe that there's a more specific, the word of knowledge is, the more faith it will build in people. And so over time, if we're hearing words of knowledge and we're giving them, I think we'll become more sensitive, not professional, but more dependent and sensitive on the Lord's word to know when he's speaking and when it's not him. Because there's times I've just wanted to say things and yet the Lord says, no, nope, let's keep worshiping right now. Let's let the word be preached. And I may have felt something, but maybe it wasn't God. Maybe I just had this emotional feeling. We have to learn how to discern the two. Practical insights for growing in the use of the word of knowledge for healing in present situations. Now, number one, the word of knowledge may come quickly, like fitting across your mind, just kind of flashing across your mind. Number two, a word of knowledge may be rather vague, tempting you to screen it out or to ignore it. Uh, number three, resist the thought that a word you may have received is not important or it's just you. Think into it. Pray into it. Ask the Lord to confirm. Am I seeing or hearing properly? Because I think God wants us to be exact. I don't think we just need to go on how we feel, but or just push it off as if we're never going to hear God like somebody else does who seems to function a word of knowledge well. There's really no other way to grow than to test these things. Uh, unpretentious unpretentious words are the best policy. Because if we're not coming up with an idea of how God, we think he would speak in a situation, or if we aren't doing that, then we need to be careful about delivering something and saying it's God. We don't want to be accused of giving a false word. And so we, we should not pretend like we know something, but that we should know it. And there's been many times where I know exactly this is totally the Lord. 
sensing this. And then other times I'm not sure. And, and sometimes I'm like, I want to share it, but I don't feel like it's God at all. And number five, do not let fear rob you and the person who might be healed or helped in some way. So if we don't speak out, then sometimes we could actually give in the fear of what people think of us because we're new at something or we're not known to do something regularly. And I don't believe the gifts of the Spirit are being left up to the professionals, to the all-stars. I believe God wants his church, his body. We've all been baptized in the Holy Spirit. We all have the ability to function in different gifts as the Spirit enables us. But if we don't try and we give in to fear, then we won't have the opportunity to actually see God use us. A faith is spelled R-I-S-K, risk. Be patient, but step out. Be risky, but step out. Last page for today's class, 57. Discerning of spirits. It is not the gift of suspicion or speculation. It is not the gift of discernment. It is not fault finding or judging people. It is not just the discerning of demons. The discerning of spirits, here's a definition, is the supernatural ability to see into the spirit world. This insight allows a believer to see angels, demons, and discern the condition of the human spirit, whether it be good or bad. Difference between demon, demonic spirits, human spirits, or the fleshly carnal man, and the spirits of God. So important facts about demon spirits. In 1 John 5.19, in the Amplified Version, it says, We know positively that we are of God. And the whole world around us is under the power of the evil one. So number one, the New Testament clearly teaches the reality and existence of demons, devils and demons. Number two, Jesus in his earthly ministry was continually confronting demonic spirits. According to the Gospels, as much as 25% of Jesus' ministry was involved with casting out demons in public. I'm going to end there and we'll pick up next week on page 58.